Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Politics in the Pub, uh, one of the oldest forums of free speech in Sydney, which could be under threat by two things, authorities and disinterest. But we soldier on. And today we talk about the most important topic, peace with justice in Ukraine, the prospects and implications. In one word, we'll be talking about war. War is a very divisive and cruel phenomenon. It divides people. It divides people over what is true. I have, I've been, having been on the front lines myself in Mindanao, where there is a three-cornered three war that have lasted two-thirds of my life, among the government versus Muslim separatists, and communist insurgents has been true. And it's very important that we do get a first-hand account of it. And we are honored and privileged today to have two gentlemen with us who have not just studied it from behind the desk or behind the screens, but have actually been there and seen things for themselves and thought for themselves, which is what we want people to do. Our first speaker is Emeritus Professor of Sydney University, Stuart Reeves, and one of the conveners of the Politics in the Pub. Another one is a most welcome and regular mainstay of Politics in the Pub, Dr. Jake Lynch, the Associate, Associate Professor and one of the founders, I believe, of the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies in the University of Sydney, also under siege by the establishment. <laughs> it's a very kind term. <laughs> but anyway, both gentlemen have been very crucial in, find, in founding and building this institution. So, without much further ado, I'd like us to give a big hand to the two speakers and listen to the first speaker, which will be Stuart Hughes. Okay, thank you, Jofra. First of all, thank you for, I've never been referred to so many times as a gentleman, so I'm, <laughs> so I'm pleased about that. And let me, on behalf of all of you, acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation on the, whose land we sit. We acknowledge their stewardship of the land, past, present, and uh, hopefully sharing with us uh, into the future. Um, I've got two caveats to make uh, immediately about the whole idea of talking about peace with justice in, in Ukraine. The first is that we can hardly talk about it without reference to Ukrainians, and I'm not a Ukrainian. Uh, in other words, we, we, need, we, we should be in very close consultation with them to hear about their priorities, their aspirations and their hopes. The second caveat I've got really contradicts the first one. Namely, that you can't really talk about Ukraine unless you talk about um, the, uh, the major international issues that surround the, and that led to the, to the war in Ukraine. You can't talk about peace with justice and then you, unless you have some idea about what a global pact would be to address the major threats to human existence, uh, climate change, pandemics and, of course, the threat of, of nuclear war. And so what I want to do is, um, and, and I'm not dodging the bullet, I don't think, I want to put this, these observations in the context of the threats to all of us, the threats which are really encapsulated in the notion that we are living, or we are the, we are the um, uh, people who have somehow constructed or colluded in the Anthropocene Age, this piece of history known as the Anthropocene Age, that period of history in which human beings have done everything possible to destroy the environment, to eradicate species, and to bring us to parallel threats, the threat to the ecosystem and the threat of, of, uh, of nuclear war. So you'll see that the, vi the violence inherent in the, the characteristics of the Anthropene Age have to be borne in mind in, every, in any negotiation about, about um, peace with justice in Ukraine. 
And one, we have to acknowledge that the major driver of the destruction in this Anthropocene, Anthropocene age is called global capitalism. The idea that, uh, that winning, uh, accumulating, destroying, exploiting is the way to run economies and societies. I mean, there are a whole set of precepts that go with those assumptions about global capitalism. Um, take over or be taken over. Dominate or be dominated. Score victories and never bother too much about thinking what the consequences are. And so, if we want to talk about the resuscitation of an economy in Ukraine, we have to, I think, uh, pay a great deal of attention to these precepts about global capitalism and ensure that there isn't a repetition there. So, it, as we talk about peace with justice in Ukraine, there are also all sorts of ripple effect consequences for all of us because I would argue that this applies to the reconstruction of a, of a very different Australia if we're going to, if our children, let alone our grandchildren, are going to be around in the next 10 or 20 years. It's that, it's that serious. So in a way, the, the efforts to settle a just peace in Ukraine between Ukrainians and Russians um, isn't only about the relationship between the Ukrainians and the Russians. Um, at that point, people were probably becoming a bit impatient and saying to themselves, well, why doesn't he get to the, to the immediate tasks? Why doesn't he deal with the practical issues? The practical issues uh, are about, or will be, about rebuilding homes and hospitals, schools and factories, uh, making sure that streets and fields are, in, in Ukraine are, are safe and that the, the terrible debris of war um, are, are cleared up. And in a way the overlay, because I've been in some of these places, the overlay to, to those practical tasks is, the, um, is about the, the return and the rehabilitation of millions of displaced people. That's going to be a massive mental health as well as an economic, cultural uh, task. And, it was going to, and it's, in a way, it's, it's not only about Ukraine, because the massive grieving that's going, that will have to go on, the dealing with loss in order to proceed to change, which is a very important theory in, in reconstruction. If you don't deal with the loss, you're not, you can't proceed to change. The grieving is going to have to be about Russians as well as as well as Ukrainians, and that 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 sort of inclusiveness is going to be crucial to making any proposals um, proposals palatable. There is a, in, and I've just been talking to my friend Colin there about this. There's a danger if you focus only on the immediate practical tasks. It's a bit like what the hell do we do about the floods in in, in Lismore or the fires on the south coast? If you concentrate only on the practical tasks, you become reactive and pragmatic. Uh, you, you only live for the day, you try to survive until tomorrow. And my experience is that if, you've, if you know where you want to go, that makes the, immediate, the solution of the immediate problem a bit easier. So in respect of Ukraine and all the neighboring countries, um, it's very important to say, to ask what sort of story do they want to tell about, about themselves? Where do they want to be in 5, 10, 20 years time? That would reply, that would refer to, to Europe, in fact, to, to the world. Where do we want to be? What story do we want to tell? If we, if we want to repeat the ideal of global capitalism and the massive build-up of arms, well, we'll we, it looks as though we'll, 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 we'll ensure self-defeat. So I'm appealing really for the, and this may sound like the academic in his ivory tower, for the, for the uh, imaginative humanitarian thinking which is, about, which is what peace with, with justice is, uh, is about. And it's going to be saying to people, look, let's have, have an end to militarism, an end to different forms of extremism, in particular nationalism. 
I mean, the Ukrainians have been accused in the in the social media about harboring Nazis, for example, and I'm sure that's true. And having a terrible, uh, terrible examples of an extreme nationalism. But I've been, I was in Russia as a, in the Soviet Union as a student. I mean, this um, right-wing nationalism is is almost as um, flourishing across Russia as it is across the United States. In fact, the United States is in danger of. I mean, I suppose. My drift into a reference to the United States is to say we don't need to take a cue from them. Um, one of the salvation for this country is to cease, was to, is to listen to what Malcolm Fraser, Fraser tried to tell us before he died that these are dangerous allies. So, though, so uh, I guess the question about what sort of story do they want to tell brings me to two papers, two which, which inf would inform what the negotiations about peace with justice are in, uh, would be in, in Ukraine. And the two papers I'm referring to were published over 200 years apart. The first in 1795 is the philosopher Immanuel Kant's um, essay about perpetual peace. How do we obtain perpetual peace? <coughs> it has a startling relevance to what's going on today. And the second paper is the one authored, I think, Jake would correct me, by, by a couple of um, a Democratic Congress man and woman in the United States, namely the, in 2019, the Green New Deal. So I'm going to finish with sort of um, dipping into those two documents, to the inspiration that comes from them, to see what that would say about a reconstructed Ukraine that would have lessons for all of us. Now, Kant tried to imagine, uh, because he, 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 wrote, he, he wrote at the end of centuries of wars, he tried to imagine the relationship between states who would never go to war, who would, be, who would have um, not only respect but a sense of what he called cultural reciprocity between states. And he actually foreshadowed, guess what, the European Union. The, and if you remember, the European Union, the initial creation of the idea for the creation of the European Union was to end the carnage of centuries of war in Europe. It wasn't about, it wasn't about um, a common currency, not initially. It was, about, it was actually about peace. So he, he posed this idea about the relationship between states. And he argued that, um, that uh, those states should be characterized, he almost foreshadowed the League of Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they should be characterized by respect for freedom of speech and for the mechanisms to hold people accountable, especially if you had a prime minister who tried to take on as many portfolios as possible. <laughs> the second thing that he did, which gives me a great enthusiasm, sense of enthusiasm, a great, Second thing which he wrote, which characterizes his paper, is to talk about uh, you and I, wherever you live, whoever you are, being citizens of the world. And he and he he talked about the values of cosmopolitanism. And he went on from that to say that cosmopolitanism presupposes a universal hospitality. Now if you can imagine that, um, I, I mean Australian, Australia, with regard to asylum seekers, please take note. He talked that powerful concept of a universal hospitality which would be um, applied to Ukraine. And in a way, I suppose the immediate response of um, countries like Poland to, um, uh, and Moldova to, uh, to um, Ukrainian refugees represented that. So. Uh, I think those, that theory about where do you want to be, what, what, uh, please don't imitate the worst effects of global capitalism. Don't hesitate to talk about universal human rights, even if you have to recognize that the Russians would be entirely dismissive of that, but, so, but, the, but the British and the Americans and Perhaps to a slightly lesser extent, the Australians have also been 
totally inconsistent and hypocritical about the respect for, for, for human rights. So uh, you have to keep saying that, um, you have to keep saying, and this is a corollary of that point about human rights, that unless you have that sort of the non-violence respect inherent in that document, then all you'll say is that governance has to be by force of arms, to wit, uh, Myanmar, Yemen, Israel, Belarus, Hong Kong. That's what that's that's what we face. So, I mean, I'll finish with the, the two points that uh, that I pinched entirely from um, from Emmanuel Kant, which was to talk about. Um, uh, to talk about uh, universal hospitality and um, and all those premises about the reciprocity between all the nation states for the purpose of survival. I mean, and that last point is reminds me that that Kant also talked about the paying attention and having enormous respect for the forces of nature, which is which is in a way. A reminder about the that if you that the biggest enemy everybody faces is uh, climate change. So if that's the biggest enemy, why is, why is any time or money or energy spent on fighting wars? And that's my that's the best I can do. <laughs> Right, now we proceed to the second speaker, Dr. Jake Lynch. Thanks, Geoffrey. Thanks, Stuart. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, if, like me, uh, you're a fan of the um, ABC television news channel, you will have marveled at its computerized subtitling service, uh, that by sheer sophisticated software, it can give a, a rendering in text of what people are saying. And the other day, Ukraine's President Zelensky was once more in the news, only um, the subtitling algorithm obviously searched in vain in its repertoire <coughs> for his name because it rendered this as René Zalvega. Oh. <laughs> and I thought at the time it's, it's, it's a good job it wasn't Monica Lewinsky, <laughs> otherwise it might have revealed rather more about the nature of the relationship Ooh. between the Ukrainian oh. government and its chief weapons supplier than the ABC would have been completely comfortable with. Uh, but I'll come to that um, a bit more later. Look, um, the fact is that um, the way in which this conflict is presented to us uh, has unfortunately taken on many of the characteristics of a, of a classic Hollywood narrative. You know, we have the goodies and the baddies, and, and you can recognize the baddies because they're the ones wearing the black hats. So even to the extent, I mean, Stuart's talking about the, the universalization of human rights. Building on that principle, we also have the laws of war that are supposed to apply to all parties to all conflicts. Juice in bello, that is the, the justice in the conduct of war. Um, but in this present atmosphere of witch hunt, uh, when Amnesty International, a week or two back, raised concerns over Ukraine putting civilians in harm's way, in contravention of the Geneva Conventions, uh, they were met with a complete um, firestorm on social media uh, and howled down. So unfortunately, we're in that kind of atmosphere of witch hunt. That makes it very difficult to talk about or to discern the outlines of what might eventually emerge as peace with justice. Um, and I say that, um, let me digress um, for a moment into conflict theory. So some of the theories that we share with students in peace and conflict studies include the ABC of conflict. So the ABC of conflict stands for attitudes, behaviours and contradictions. And the proposition is that conflict actually is a set of relations manifest in relationships across a social formation um, which is characterised by <coughs> incompatible goals. So conflict is not synonymous with war. War is a form of behaviour which is a response to conflict. It's by no means the only possible response to conflict, and let's be thankful for that. But it's always very difficult to, to get at the contradictions, to open up the contradictions amid a situation of hardened and extreme attitudes, and that's what we've got at the moment. So let's try to roll that back a bit. Um, we have to reopen the distinctions between 
um, effort to explain the behaviours or understand the behaviours of parties to conflict on the one hand and attempt to excuse or justify them on the other. So to make it very clear, what I'm about to do is to try to help us think why the behaviour of President Putin and the Russians may be explicable as part of a sequence of discernible causes and consequences in a search for clues as to how we might envisage and fashion peace with justice. And I think we have to begin with the strategic question, why is Russia still the enemy? Okay, um, over 100 years, nearly 150 years ago now, um, we were in a situation in Europe with the, the breakup of the last of the, the gunpowder empires of the late medieval and early modern periods, namely the Ottoman Empire. There was a, an uprising in Bulgaria for independence, and it was put down with extreme force and violence against civilians uh, by the Turks, not only with regular troops, but also with these Bashi Bazouk brigades. Uh, and they left the bodies of people heaped in the streets. So um, the Bulgarian emigre community in Constantinople persuaded the, the US and the UK ambassador to visit Sofia to see this for themselves. And they were accompanied by journalists, uh, and indeed they duly recorded this as a, as a major atrocity. What happened next was that William Ewart Gladstone was running a by-election campaign in the constituency of Midlothian in Scotland. And he took up this theme as the dominant one of his campaign, and he successfully shamed the British government into renouncing its military alliance with the Ottoman Empire, which it had relied on 20 years earlier in the Crimean War. Thus opening the way for a humanitarian military intervention to roll the Ottomans back to the very outskirts of Constantinople and liberate the Bulgarian people as a dividend for their suffering. And the lead country in this humanitarian intervention was Russia. So, back then, Russia was the enemy, then wasn't the enemy, then of course the events of 1917 made Russia the enemy once again, then in World War II, Russia was not the enemy, then it became the enemy. So there's a, a set of ready-made reasons why Russia has been the enemy, has played the role of the enemy in all these uh, situations. What is puzzling is why, after the fall of communism, Russia remained the enemy. Indeed, um, one might go further and ask the question, if Russia, if there was no good reason for Russia to be the enemy, why do we still have NATO? NATO, after all, characterized itself as a purely defensive alliance. So the Russians, after the fall of, of communism and after the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, were left to scratch their heads over why NATO was continuing, and they were left to interpret it in no other way than as an alliance against them, especially when their semi-official, if not official, offers or applications to join NATO were persistently turned down. Fast forward to 1999, the Kosovo crisis, NATO changed its rules. Previously, it had only been allowed to act as NATO on the territory of a member state. That rule was changed to allow it to carry out 90 odd days of bombing on the territory of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. The Slav brothers, the Serbs, okay? Um, so now you've got an alliance that is no longer purely defensive, but now has an avowed offensive capability pointed at the Russians. And this is after a decade when former members of the Warsaw Pact had joined NATO, violating assurances given to Soviet leaders by a glittering array of Western uh, statespersons, François Mitterrand, Hans Dietrich Genscher, even James Baker, that NATO would not expand eastward. What happened, in fact, was that the, the, new, the newly liberated countries, um, Czech Republic, Hungary, Romania, kept saying, yes, you know, you keep on pestering us to join NATO, we can't afford it, because we can't, we haven't got the money to spend on our military to upgrade it to the standards NATO would require. Very well, the US Congress said, we've had all these meetings with these eminent weapons manufacturers, they persuaded us to enact legislation to provide for taxpayers 
to pick up the bill for all these weapons that we're going to send to these countries. So, hey presto, there's NATO expanding eastwards. So through all this period, NATO is encroaching. It looks like a hostile alliance with a remit for offensive action. Uh, and then suddenly the last domino begins to wobble, namely Ukraine. Let's be absolutely clear at this stage, the reason, there are good reasons why Ukraine is not presently a NATO member. Even now, amid the hysteria we've seen, nobody has suggested that Ukraine become a NATO member, and there are good reasons for that. Uh, one, because Germany doesn't want to risk Berlin, Paris doesn't want to, sorry, France doesn't want to risk Paris, Britain doesn't want to risk London, to keep that blue and yellow flag that we now all know so well fluttering above the territory of the Donbass. Neither should they. It would be completely disproportionate. So nobody is suggesting that, that, NATO be, uh, that uh, Ukraine become a NATO member. Now, um, therefore, um, we, we got to this position of stalemate. Uh, we got to this uh, gradually kind of grinding uh, progression of NATO ever further eastwards. Um, dangerous talk about Ukraine's right to make its own security arrangements. Yeah, forget that, okay, because um, no, no country has the right to join NATO. It has the right to apply to join NATO, then it needs a unanimous decision by all existing NATO members to let it join NATO. And that's never been forthcoming and, and it wouldn't be. So now we've reviewed some of the reasons for understanding and explaining why Russia under Putin lashed out. We have distinguished that carefully from any suggestion of excusing or justifying it, because it remains inexcusable and unjustifiable. So let us try to discern what we can amid this potted history of the prospects for peace with justice. And I could talk about three forms of justice. Justice is multifarious, of course, but let's talk about three forms of justice. Political justice, socio-economic justice, and climate justice. With regard first to the climate justice, um, it is a significant blot on the otherwise impressive record of Angela Merkel that Germany planned for new hydrocarbon infrastructure to come online in the Europe of the 2020s, whatever the provenance of the gas. Okay? So now that um, Nord Stream 2 pipeline is mothballed, What's being built instead is an LNG, liquefied natural gas, terminal at Germany's deep water port, Wilhelmshaven. And it's going to be a molecular facility. So its immediate task will be to take delivery of shiploads of LNG from the United States as a short-term replacement for this coming winter for the gas that is not now flowing from Russia. But it's being claimed, at least, that it will then transition to handling liquefied hydrogen as part of Germany's commitment to meet a net zero target by 2045. So that is one promising augury for peace with justice to come out of the Ukraine crisis. There are, of course, uh, two arguments being made. One argument is that with uh, the jeopardy that we have, of which we have now been apprised, which is um, a condition of supplying oil and gas from Russia, we should all rush to increase our own capacity and our own supplies or source them from elsewhere instead. Uh, that is to be deprecated. Uh, what is altogether better, and is in there in the mix somewhere, is the impulse which says we must bring forward the moment when we cease to rely on hydrocarbons in the interests of climate justice. Because as people here will be well aware, Global heating is not only a danger in itself, but is also exacerbating existing axes of disadvantage and injustice all over the world. So there is one glimmer of hope for climate justice that could come out of this. Second one, socio-economic justice. Now, it's been a persistent feature of the transition from state communism that um, the variant of capitalism which people have attempted to instantiate in its place, has borne all the worst characteristics of capitalism. Because, of course, there are many different capitalisms. 
There is the variety familiar from the, the Anglosphere, shall we say, the, the casino capitalism, you know, the kind of uh, a variety that Stuart's talking about, where international flows of uh, Arontier finance are seeking out parasitically opportunities to profit, probably to whisk away the ill-gotten gains into a tax haven. Uh, that is the dominant form in the UK. Uh, it's, it's a very prominent form in the US, and it has made uh, many more inroads than uh, uh, we, we should have allowed here in Australia. Uh, but there is also um, the other, uh, or another form of capitalism, sometimes called Rhenish capitalism, particularly associated with the German economy, uh, which is inscribed deeply into the rules and regulations of the European Union. So one of the encouraging auguries from this is that Ukraine's application to join the European Union has been accepted to the extent that it's now a candidate member. Uh, and it would be altogether better um, to, to um, uh, develop the Ukrainian economy along those lines. What a change that would be from the disastrous period of the 1990s when the former Soviet space was subjected to what was called economic shock treatment, when price controls were abandoned overnight, public services were immediately shut down and everyone thrown out of work, associated with inflation in the thousands of percent and those unforgettable scenes that are seared deeply into the psyche of the Russian and Ukrainian peoples of having to gather up meagre possessions, display them on the pavement outside your home in exchange for a few coins to get food for your family. That was the result of the, the economic shock treatment uh, that was uh, imposed uh, on the, the former Soviet countries after the fall of communism. No, we, we mustn't go there. Uh, and to that extent, um, the um, rather more um, uh, sinister and um, less propitious developments in Ukraine include the adoption of these laws which were passed by the Parliament uh, only last month, just over a month ago, uh, which will um, uh, deregulate industrial relations to the extent of allowing employers with under 250 staff to um, hire and fire, uh, fire and rehire, in fact, um, which uh, is inimical to the kind of Rhenish capitalism of the EU and indeed is outlawed by social provisions in the EU Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. Uh, and this, incidentally, is why the British Tories wanted out of the EU, because to them it represents an interference in the God-given right of Arontier capitalists to accumulate and reproduce capital without any responsibility to anyone but themselves. So. Ukraine's candidate membership of the EU is a, another good sign. Now, let's come on to the, say the most difficult one to last, the political justice. Um, in the schema set out um, of conflict theory by Johann Galton, uh, one of the uh, chief proponents, chief theorists of conflict, um, he characterizes um, uh, peace as the absence of violence. So because if you remember, conflict is a relationship between two or more parties with incompatible goals. We're never going to get rid of conflict. We went around demanding an end to conflict as the definition of peace. It would be too big an ask, you can say. So let's instead define it as an absence of violence. What does violence mean? Galton's influential definition is of violence not by the form it takes, but by the effect it brings about the abrogation of human potential. And violence can be direct, cultural, or structural. Structural violence includes structures that oblige people to live together that don't want to, or live apart that do want to. And so, taking that cue, the outlines of a peace deal for Ukraine must surely involve some international supervision, preferably UN supervision, of some kind of exercise to settle to everyone's satisfaction just exactly what arrangements are desired by the populations of the Crimea, Donbass and Luhansk as to the flag that flutters over their local town hall, 
what is the status of the border, um, which may very well divide them from their friends and family, and how they want to cross it and how they want that to be set up. Now, it's, it's very important to keep uh, talking about a peace deal because, of course, that is one way in which a war can end. Another way, I wouldn't say the other way, but another way in which a war can end is for an outright victory, was by an outright victory, by one side over the other side. And there seems to me to be far too loose and far too liberal an assumption that that is a feasible outcome among a great deal of commentary, especially media commentary, about this crisis. Um, is it feasible? Fierce critics of, of uh, wicked old President Putin, like um, the Guardian's Simon Tisdall, for instance, one of my favourite uh, uh, media um, uh, whipping boys, um, that he, he's such a, um, he's so down, he's very really down on President Putin, but somehow, somewhere along the line, President Putin will discover some hitherto unheralded restraint or sense of proportion and not start a nuclear war. Instead, he will accept complete military defeat and humiliation. That seems to me to be a gamble too far. So it seems to me that we need to talk about a peace deal, we need to talk about a peace agreement. An agreement is not with oneself, it is with the other, by definition. So we need to think about what is agreeable, not only to us and to Ukraine, but also to the Russians. And some mechanism to determine the status of those territories, which is taken out of their hands, preferably given to the United Nations, would be part of it. Uh, another one would be for everyone to acknowledge what everyone actually already agrees, which is that Ukraine will not become a member of NATO. And once you've got those two building blocks in place, you have the potential <coughs> for political justice, you have the potential for socio-economic justice, and you have the potential for climate justice, and that could be, that could fulfil what the same Johann Gelsen always said about conflict, which is that it's an opportunity, to use a vogue phrase, to build back better. Wow. Thank you very much, Stuart and Jake. And um, I'd like to first, I, I'd like to give everyone a crack at asking questions first. Any questions from the floor? Uh, Kathy. Yeah, I've got a question for Jake. Um, we've had some trouble with the recognition of uh, referenda in the past in uh, Crimea and Donbass. Do you envisage getting past that problem of recognising what the people on either side want? Look, I mean, if we take a step back from the, the immediate crisis, we can see that this is um, really an effect of an international system that is still at root based on competitive nation states. And the era of competitive nation states over hundreds of years has e emerged and evolved in parallel with efforts to regulate, limit and restrain their competitive behaviours. The apogee of that system today is the United Nations. That's why it's been so concerning to see how marginalised the UN has become in handling this crisis, except around the edges with such issues as ensuring grain supplies. But really, that's why referenda have to be taken out of the hands of the parties to conflict and given to the responsible international body, which can only be the United Nations. And only then will results emerge that can carry credibility with everybody and cease to be in themselves part of the conflict. And that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Joe. Joe. Who's next? Right in front of you. Right in front of you. To your right. You. Yes. Stuart, you mentioned two documents by Kant and the Green Deal. Yeah. I maybe I missed it, but you didn't. I, I didn't feel that I heard much about the Green Deal. I heard a lot about Kant. Yeah, that's that's true. I probably probably. I, I mean, there, there are two strands to the Green New Deal, as I see it. One is about um, rescuing everybody, rescuing economies from dependence on fossil fuels, so that so that the preservation of planet Earth is a priority. But it also, but that objective is related to all the 
considerations about the abolition of poverty, dealing with inequality and racial discrimination. So all those social economic policies have to go, they argue, have to go hand in hand with the effort to protect uh, planet Earth. That's, that's the essence of the Green New Deal. I mean, in a way, it's, it, it, it looks like a, um, a splendid piece of what Tawney called fellowship, and most I know as socialism. But of course, the word, I mean, this is a problem. The, 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 the Americans, the American public, the Ameri not just the political public, but can't stand the word. They, they, go, they, they go into fits if you use that word. So, um, uh, so that, um, you know, negotiations about anything have got to be clear about the connotations of, of words. And um, I like to think the Green New Deal is a statement about socialism. But the, the odd thing is that you, <laughs> in certain contexts you can't call it that. So if anyone wants to ask a question and not be not be invisible, please. Inform oh, them. you mind being filmed? <laughs> <laughs> Jane, uh, just uh, interested in your analysis of what is going on between Ukraine and the Ukraine and Russia. But some of the commentary I'm reading is Putin doesn't even recognise Ukraine as an independent country. His drivers seem to be entirely political from his own point of view. As in, he's the tough guy. He's the guy that rides bare chest on a, a horse. He's the big tough guy. And that's the only way he's going to keep power because the rate at which he's doing in his oligarchs, who don't agree with him, means that if they, if they decide to rebel, he's no longer the man. And hence the end of this, I'm going to take back Ukraine. I'm going to get rid of Nazis. To me, it's fabricated. And it's a horrible fabrication. Uh, yeah, I think I think it is a horrible fabrication, and um, you know the, the the same remarks apply to to Russia as to I mean you know it, it's no coincidence that that we're always talking about problems in spaces like this associated with the three biggest nuclear armed countries whose behaviour it is most difficult to restrain, namely Russia, China, and the United States. Okay. But there is no option but for the rest of the world to come together through the United Nations and say, we're going to take charge here. You know, all those are member states of the UN, they are obliged to take their disputes to the UN. Now, you know, ultimately there has to be some kind of agreement. And as I say, ultimately you can't agree with yourself by definition. Okay, you have to agree with somebody. And Putin is the person with which you will have to agree, with whom you will have to agree. Now, you know, nobody's suggesting that we therefore agree that we deem Ukraine no longer to exist. Uh, but what I am saying is that some um, international, preferably UN brokered process is going to have to take place to determine that border and what happens around that border and the political and constitutional arrangements for those Eastern Republics and the Crimea. Uh, because it, as, as long as it's not the UN doing it, it's always going to be a weapon of war and it's always going to continue the conflict. That's the only alternative. Yeah, I just want to make an observation about what goes on within states, not just in terms of borders. And let's, I mean, um, Russia is, and here I'm going to, I will reflect on the standard of respect for human rights in America and Australia and Britain as well, but Russia is, is, is a hugely authoritarian state. Have a conversation with Alexei Navalny. I mean, the, there is no freedom of press. All those precepts that Immanuel Kant wrote down are not observed whatsoever. It, for whatever reason, it, I, mean, I mean, the major reason is that it's intellectually lazy to, to tell, to run anything, either your family or your university department or a hospital, uh, by telling people, I just what to do and punishing punishing them for not doing it. I mean it's intellectually lazy. So the dialogue and that applies to to every I mean it applies to the way the Americans use prisons to control their population. So and in in a way the issue about not about losing face or not is is crucial to this. I mean it's about every time I've been in conflict zones People are saying, please take me seriously. 
right? And, and Putin wants to be, I mean, I, I wouldn't say as an opening gambit, well, you're an authoritarian bastard, right? <laughs> but you, you, but um, you can't... So you say, good, good morning, you running dog of US imperialism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that the saving face, it seems to me, is, is an acknowledgement that we're all threatened by, by something else. And, and, I mean, it, it, with regard to China, for example, at the moment, it's quite obvious that the, that the heat and the floods across China are, are doing, uh, occur, hitting their economy and their, their um, public life enormously. Not, I mean, as bad of, as, if not worse, than the arrival of, from, of COVID. Look, I mean, I mean so, somebody somewhere along the line is going to have to take some responsibility here, OK? I mean, I mentioned Kosovo the Kosovo crisis. Um, I covered the Kosovo crisis as a reporter for the UK Sky News um, at NATO headquarters in Brussels, and it reached an impasse because after whatever it was, 78 days of bombing, I think, there were no credible military targets left to bomb. Uh, and NATO kept saying, oh, well, you know, we're going to keep bombing until there is a withdrawal of Yugoslav army troops from Kosovo. And the Yugoslav army troops were saying, well, you know, how do we signal that we're withdrawing? Because the minute we come out of our rabbit holes, you'll bomb us. So, so it was classic, a classic example. It was the Clinton administration at the time. Classic example of the essential lack of maturity in US foreign policy. You can will the means, but not the ends. So others took responsibility, right? So two mediators were appointed. One for the Russians was, uh, for the Serbs rather, was Viktor Chernomirin who'd recently been Russian Prime Minister, and one for the uh, Kosovo Albanians was Marty Atasari, the Finnish president, speaking on behalf of the EU. And they came up with a, with a text which was agreeable to all sides, that was adopted first at the G8, because Russia was still invited then, the following day at the EU summit in Köln, and then it went to the UN to become a UN Security Council resolution. So other actors, the Russians and the EU, took over. The grown-ups took over. Okay? The, the, the man-child, with all the latest toys and gadgets, spoiled rotten, you know, with the kind of uh, money coming out of every orifice, namely the, the US uh, weapons industry, hadn't a clue how to end that particular episode. They had to turn <laughs> to other responsible actors. And that is what is going to ha have to happen this time. I mean, at the moment, we're, we're well into the neoconservative playbook for the war. Uh, which is that this should last forever. You know, Hillary Clinton could hardly contain her glee when this first happened. She said, this is going to be Russia's Afghanistan, Russia's forever war. It's going to be a constant running sore and a drain on a strategic rival. You know, great, that's, that's, that's good for us. You know, there is some truth in the, in the complaint that you hear from the Russians sometimes that America seems to want to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. Okay, so, so we can't really tolerate the neoconservative playbook for the war. At some point, the grown-ups are going to have to take over and sort this out. <laughs> well, one last question. I have two questions, okay? Yeah. Firstly, I think the, 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 the problem is much, much deeper than that. We know that before uh, starting this war, there was a meeting between Putin and Biden in Europe. After that, uh, the war has started. Um, the question is that who was, I mean, the order was done by, by Biden to Putin that you can now attack and do whatever you want. But who was behind this order? That was the Vatican. Then we, then we check the inclusive capitalism Vatican. We see that behind all these criminal activities is the Vatican in association with all other Abrahamic religions, including Jewish and uh, Islamic religion. And then they are behind all this crime that is happening around the world, all this destruction. And, uh, and, then, and can another, you, can another you... thing is that um, my, my question to Professor Rees uh, regarding uh, <coughs> Nationalism, because you, you talked about uh, right-wing nationalists and 
which are the sure. negative sure. one. But we we have also positive nationalists. We, we have progressive nationalists. Sure. Like Palestinian nationalists, like Kurdish nationalists, like Iranian nationalists who are fighting against a brutal Islamic regime in Iran that has killed hundreds of thousands of innocent Iranians and forced 8 million Iranians to sure. leave the country, which is actually genocide. Okay, it's a good, good. Let, let me have a go at the second bit so first. Much. And then let me just try and simplify. There's a major issue here, in, which is called sovereignty. All the you hear the word sovereignty, protecting our sovereignty, uh, every day of the week. Uh, sovereignty is a huge, in a world which is invaded by pandemics or by the threat of nuclear war, or by global change, sovereignty ceases to make much difference. And yet, I mean, it's okay in sport. Um, so, so you could say, you know, you're representing this country or that country. But otherwise, so we, we need to demystify the notion of sovereignty because, this, because sovereignty <laughs> would, uh, contributes to these extremes of nationalism. On, with regard to what I understood to be your first question, there's a bit of me, it's a bit impatient with the question who the hell started the war. If you look at the predicament of the poor people of Ukraine at the moment, or the tens of thousands of Russian soldiers who have been slaughtered, and whose parents presumably are grieving somewhere. I want. I'm. I'm, a, I'm an old social worker. I want to know. You know what? What the problem I've got to deal with on a Friday night when it's raining and when there's nowhere to live. And so, um, so uh, historians will deal subsequently with your important first question: Who? You know who started it? What did Biden say to Putin, and vice versa? But I have a sense of impatience about the the, the immediate um, issues. Look, I think, I think we can, uh, we're probably much more likely to find clues in other forms and sources of causation for observed effects, okay? Um, when uh, there is a, a kind of complex social determination of any kind, you can identify causation and put it under a number of different headings. And you can arrange those on, on a spectrum. Um, at one end of the spectrum is coincidence. Shit just does happen. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum is conspiracy. And that's what you're suggesting. Conspiracy, which is a, a deliberate, knowing collusion to bring about an intended effect. But they are always extremely marginal, at best marginal, in terms of explaining where the generative force arises. We're far more likely to find it in systems and structures. You know, if you sustain a military industrial complex, you are going to produce a kind of strategic overhang which is going to lead to wars. I mean, just last Friday, what was it, Operation Pitch Black commenced in Australia's Northern Territory. And I've been hymning the virtues of the Germans with their Rhenish capitalism, let it be recorded, that the Luftwaffe is in action over Australian skies at this moment mm. as part of Operation Pitch Black. Uh, but, you know, rehearsing for war with the very clear implication uh, that this is in pursuit of NATO's new strategic concept, which is explicitly identifying China as a threat to our way of life. Right? So, so you know, this is the result of, of this sheer strategic overhang of military capability. It exerts a gravitational pull on political and media responses. And as long as it is there, that's what's going to happen. You know, it's nearly 50 years ago now that um, a very influential essay was published by Stephen Lutz called Power, a Radical View. Stuart knows it well. And the, the first dimension of power, the behavioural dimension, consists precisely in the identifiable words and deeds of named actors. If you concentrate only on that dimension, you will miss all the important stuff, because the, some of it takes place in the second dimension, which is the conspiracy, most of it in the third dimension, which is the mobilization of the biases of the system through innumerable channels. Uh, and this really is, is you know, Mainstream social science—that's how we—that's how we try to explain stuff. Conspiracy is a very marginal 
important to Australia in, in any significant social determination. Okay, yeah. One last question. Noah? Um, I believe, uh, really, um, the instigation of the war between Russia and Crimea we must admit, it was completely instigated by the Americans. This is by saying NATO, by saying they want to open a center in the Ukraine, all these things, and yet we're blaming Putin for attacking. Putin has to either, has to protect his own territory, which is, of course, Russia, he doesn't want the enemy at his doorstep, because America always called Russia the enemy. And yet, uh, they still, why do they still think Putin should not attack Crimea, should not protect his own territory? Well, uh, this is 2014 we're talking about, right? <laughs> so in this um, situation I was referring to, where there are these systems and structures in place, you have a, a compet an intrinsically competitive system of nation-states, uh, you have efforts and structures to regulate and restrain their competitive behaviours which ebb and flow in their effectiveness. One could wish the UN was more effective, and that's a perennial refrain. But by 2014, if you look at the consequences of that situation, it's led to a series of wars, notably um, the occupation of Afghanistan from 2001 and the invasion of Iraq from 2003, where Washington has taken it on the chin. So sending American troops across the borders of another country is a political lemma. It's, 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 like, it's like it was after Vietnam. So the, the game now, the form it takes now, is to provoke the other into initiating something, either in Crimea or in Ukraine, or now possibly Taiwan. But it's the same, it's an effect of the same constellation, the same configuration of systems and structures and the forces and impetus to which they give rise. So it's futile to look at whose fault it is. It's more um, interesting, it's more propitious, it, it affords more opportunities to think about peace with justice, to examine the operation of these systems and structures and, and figure out how to get around them. Uh, and that's really what the game is now. Yes, but um, we say we're talking about America sending arms to the Ukraine. By doing that, it's elongating the war for starters, and it's killing a lot of innocent people. So why are they sending arms to a small country to fight against a big country, when they know all that's going to happen is innocent people are going to get killed? And also, when what happened when Russia wanted to put a, 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 a center in Cuba? America straight away threatened Russia with nuclear. This, this, this is exactly almost the same situation here. And I think America has a hand in all the wars around the world that are happening at the moment. So why is this any different? Uh, look, I'd be aware of the blame game, which is, you know, fucking, I don't have any time for the US attitude policy with regard to Cuba at all, but I, I mean, it's too. I don't want to accumulate all the all the sins of the past in order to deal with a massive problem in the present. And um, but I mean, Putin and Carlo did say they didn't think Ukraine was a nation. They didn't think they were an identifiable people. They didn't. There were arguments when we did a, a people's forum a few weeks ago about whether they really had a language of their own. And so um, I, I think. Um, uh, <laughs> There was a, a justifiable resistance by the by the Ukrainian people to those to those threats, and after all, the you know it's quite obvious that Putin and his advisors. It's not just it's not just Putin. It, I think I mean Putin has to be he's a convenient guy Fox of um, of, uh, of Russia, um, but um, the idea of a greater Russia, the enormous I mean the enormous disappointment. Of the downfall of, of what happened in the in the downfall of the Soviet Union, and and the way to retrieve some features of that was clearly uh, a, a part of Russian thinking, understandable, but in a world that has to um, resolve the avoid nuclear war, 
and avoid a threat to human existence from, from climate change. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Why are we spending, why, why does, the, um, why does the, uh, the arms industry all over the place, the industrial military complex that Jake referred to, um, fostered by Australia desperate to be much more successful as arms exporters than we have been, um, why, why spend even five minutes of your time on that when, when um, the threat to human existence is, is, around, is, is, is tomorrow? The, Austra the Australian newspaper um, has reported over the weekend that a significant inflection point was passed on Friday, which is the first day in history when solar power put more electricity into the Australian national grid than coal. Mm -hmm. And the Age newspaper on the same day reported uh, the um, enormous investment that China is making in renewable energy. So I took those as <coughs> hopeful signs that we may have turned a corner and we may be groping our way towards more of a semblance of climate justice in both those two instances. Let's hope so. Well, uh, thank you very much, Stuart and Jake. And uh, we, uh, you are not only gentlemen, but scholars as well, uh, and we've, yeah, we've, we've learned quite, and I would call you gentlemen indeed, because you went beyond the normal blame game and simply taking sides and sticking to it. You studied, uh, you, Stuart gave a very excellent reflection on Kant, on cultural reciprocity, universal hospitality, and respect for the sources of nature. War is a natural consequence of misunderstanding. While Jake gave the process of understanding how war or peace arises from an examination of attitudes, the behaviors in dealing with incompatible goals, and the consequences that would either be war, or may I dare say the opposite of war, which is peaceful trade. So thank you very much for your thank, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>